Human society was created because of food. It was easier to make food together. When I was 12, I went on a camping trip with some vegetarians. Somehow I made that connection. I came home and I announced that I was no longer eating meat. A few months later, my mother just said, you know what? I'm not preparing a vegetarian meal for you. You're on your own, you cook. I started cooking when I was probably 12 and a half. My mission has partly been for a long time to make really wonderful food accessible to all, to take the mystery out of it, to take the fear factor out of it. A lot of people feel, well, plant-based is about, you know, I wanna be healthy. And I think that's great. It gets a door open, but at some point, it's not just about personal health. If we just think about our personal health, we don't think beyond ourselves. It doesn't matter if we've got washboard abs. It doesn't matter if you can be an ultra marathoner on a plant-based diet, if the planet is dying, if all the other animals on the planet, if the species are being wiped out because of animal agriculture. We have to think beyond ourselves. We have to think about the lives of all living beings on this planet. We have to think about the living planet itself. We have to think about whether or not we can feed 10 billion people. We have to think about the amount of land that's allocated to animal agriculture and what that's doing in terms of food equity for people across the globe. What about the person in India or Africa or somewhere else in a food desert right here in the United States that doesn't have access to healthy, sustainable, organic foods? We have to start thinking about them. Let's start thinking beyond ourselves and we have to remember that the world is made up of individuals. So the faster that individuals can make that change, just having that knowledge is a key to your own personal happiness because you can wake up every day feeling empowered that I am doing something to help change the course of the planet. So we're here with Miyoko Shinner. Is that the correct way? That Shiner? Cor Shinner. It's All right. Shinner. Shinner. Yep. <laughs> and really excited to meet you and especially have you out on the east coast i want to say is like you're the martha stewart of vegan cooking in a way because you cook at home you share recipes you now have an amazing line of products that is accessible and affordable from you know across the country which is really awesome and you even have an animal sanctuary. So you really like a full, well-rounded icon, I think amongst plant-based and vegans. So really a pleasure well, to meet you. Well, thank you. And that's such a nice introduction and, and thank you for giving me all that credit. So, <laughs> um, yeah. so I just kind of, I want to I wanna take a step back mm -hmm. and get a little bit more of an understanding of, you know, who is Miyoko? You're a California girl. Are you originally a California native or? No, I'm originally from Japan. Oh, uh, I grew really? up eating okay. rice and miso soup and uh, didn't have any dairy until I was probably about eight years old. Uh, and it was, uh, well, actually, that's not true. I do remember a very special trip my mother took me on in Japan. She got me all dressed up and she said we were going something, somewhere really special. We got into a taxi, we went into Tokyo somewhere, went to this, I just remember, I was probably about five years old, there was some fancy restaurant. A waiter came and we sat at this empty table and he brought over uh, two little glasses, those little ice cream cups, mm -hmm. with one scoop each of vanilla ice cream. This is the first time I ever had, had ice cream. And I tasted it and I thought, oh my God, I was transported to heaven. I had never eaten anything like that. I mean, I was eating rice and you know miso soup and things like that, fish at the time. Uh, and this was just, uh, I thought, oh my gosh, this is what America is going to be like. Because I knew I was moving to America to join our father. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I'm going to go to America. I'm going to eat ice cream. My hair is going to turn blonde. It's, you know, my life is going to be completely different. Wow. And so then what was the, you know, the dream to the reality of when you, you and your mother came over and joined your father in the U.S.? It was really a shock. We landed in the United States at SFO, San Francisco. <laughs> My dad picked us up and I envisioned like this George Jetson type of really fancy modern car. <laughs> and he drove up in a, in a Volkswagen bus. You know, because this is back in the 60s and people were... I mean, how like, groovy is well, that? Well, it was really groovy, <laughs> but it wasn't groovy to me because I was looking for something really sleek and modern and this is like, what kind of vehicle is this? So we got in, 
we drove through San Francisco and every time I saw this tall building, I thought, I kept asking, is that where we're gonna live? Is that where we're gonna live? And we kind of kept driving through San Francisco, across the Golden Gate Bridge, and we start and like, entering this, second, wait a minute, we're leaving, we're leaving a city, <laughs> where are we going? And Because I'd grown up next to rice paddies in oh, Japan, in this country. Wow. I mean, this little uh, village, uh, which is no longer village, it's you know part of the sprawling Tokyo urban, uh, met, you know, metropolitan yeah, setting, but at the time it was just a little tiny village. There was one car there, and well, I and think you know, it's very just similar to the sprawling San Francisco. That's that's Bay right. Area that's that's Valley. exactly what what. But anyway, we ended up driving through Marin County, through these hills, up this little tiny street, and there were all these trees. And we had to walk up all these funky stairs to get to this little house, and. I thought, oh my God, this is no better than Japan. <laughs> Why did I leave Japan? Now I'm in the middle of someplace even more rural. Um, so I was pretty aghast. Um, but you know, so my goal at the time was to become American. I just wanted to have blue eyes, wake up one morning and have blue eyes and blonde hair um, and not take rice balls for lunch. That was what I was doing. But I remember my first experience eating pizza, which was cheese. And I thought this was gonna be my true transformative moment. I got invited to this party and a they had pi party. a pizza party and I was going to have pizza for the first time. And I thought, oh, my God, this is going to be the best moment of my life. And I hate it. It was the most disgusting thing I'd ever eaten. I thought, how do people eat this stuff? <laughs> like, it was just so oily and greasy and it was cloying. And it was going down my throat and dripping down my face. And I thought, oh, yeah, and the oil's coming down. Oh, hands. my God. I thought it was so disgusting, you know. But anyway, I learned quickly how to how to enjoy pizza, <laughs> among other things. So. You know, how how then throughout your journey ha, of wanting, you know, this California dream girl, how did you then get back to your own cultural roots, you know, through, as, you've, as you've grown older? Yeah, yeah, I think what happens with a lot of people who are immigrants is initially you want to assimilate. Yep. And so you want to forget the everything. country you left. You want to forget everything. and. I, it got to a point where I stopped speaking Japanese. I didn't want to speak Japanese to my mother anymore, who's, whose English was very, very poor. And uh, I just wanted to be an American. And then you get to a point later in life when you actually mature and you realize, who was that person I left? What was that country I left? How do I embrace that? Mm -hmm. And so I actually went back to Japan after college and just figured out this is the land that I came from. These are the flavors I grew up with. and. There was a total acceptance of it. And then after that, it's a matter of how do you marry those two uh, very disparate cu cultures? How do you embrace them? How do you incorporate them so they can become a whole? In your early 20s, did you always know that you wanted to be on a food path? Because later you opened up a restaurant in San Francisco and then you had a alternative meat company where you were producing mm -hmm. and manufacturing alternative meat products. And then the chapter that we're at now, you've yes. arrived. You've arrived at the non-dairy cheese, which is, you know, in a Trader Joe's, which is awesome. Yep. Um, so did you did you ever see that trajectory for yourself? Not really. In my early twenties, I really wanted to be a jazz singer, and I was in Tokyo, you know, singing in all these dive bars, you know, doing my share of fifty-dollar gigs or actually you know that maybe 10,000 like yen really gigs cool so it was it was fun you know it's a ha it's a hassle and and uh, you're just hanging out at bars till late at night and if you like that you know the funny thing about me is that i i like to go to bed early and so <laughs> hanging out at 12 midnight you know trying to you get a to gig get was just spot. yeah i mean that was just like really not my lifestyle mm -hmm. at the same time i was developing how to make these vegan recipes, trying to veganize everything. And at some point in my life, I just said, you know, this is really where my heart is. This is how I can reach people. And so it, probably at some point in my, my late 20s, I decided that was the path I really wanted to take. Very cool. So when going from a restaurant, I think that's, you know, it's a, a day and night job. Oh, yes. And it's very, like, laborsome. But then how did you get into the food manufacturing side? Because I think those are two totally separate worlds. Oh, they're totally separate worlds, you know, and, and it, I sort of fell into it. So I had this little restaurant in San Francisco called Now and Zen. It was <laughs> one of the first, I would say, um, you know, we called it a bistro, but it was like a first one of the first higher end vegan restaurants in the Bay Area, because up until then, vegan restaurants were like, you know, they were serving lentil loaf with some sort of mysterious brown gravy. And, and then and like a side of sprouts. <laughs> yeah, something like that. That's kind of what it was. Uh, and this was the first place that was serving, you know, what I would consider to be as close to French or Italian cuisine as possible. Those are my favorite cuisines. 
Um, and you know, I was there day in and day out. I had I broke my bag of water when I with my first on uh, my second pregnancy there on the restaurant floor during the lunch lunch rush, and I had to run to the hospital. Wow. Uh, you know, and then and then a week later, I was back at work with my baby on my back, you know, running around the kitchen. So it was that kind of hands-on. You're like constantly doing things um, in your own kitchen. But really, what happened was I had this recipe that I developed called the Unturkey which was uh, something that I published my first cookbook. It was a, a seitan turkey that was stuffed and that had a skin made out of yuba. And so we served it for Thanksgiving and we also sold it out of the restaurant. And we were selling hundreds of these every Thanksgiving. And finally someone said, you know, you need to commercialize this product. You need to go to this trade show. So I went to this trade show in Baltimore, the Natural Products Expo East, not knowing what to accept, expect. expect. And I sold tens of thousands of dollars of this product that weekend. And then the question was, well, what do I do now? How do I get it to these retailers on the East Coast? Um, and that was just crazy. So that's kind of how we started. I went back there, had to figure it all out. Back then, it was a lot easier to get products to retailers than it is today. today so there's, what are the barriers then that well, make it, it difficult? It just, you know, I think, uh, first of all, the FDA, food safety is a much bigger issue. Back then, you could just pretty much do anything. And, as you know, local health department would come and inspect, but the standards were much lower than they are today. Um, so it's not a good thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a much better thing. But, you know, it's it's... There's more hurdles in making sure that your plant is set up correctly, et cetera. All of that's very, very important. But back then, it was just so easy to just sort of find a commercial kitchen and you know put on a hairnet and, and go, to go to work and just do it. I mean, I remember I had these meat, uh, I came up with this concept for these meat substitutes. I had an unchicken, unribs, and unsteak out, the unsteak out. So, I managed to talk the distributors into buying all three. The fact is, I hadn't actually developed the unstake out yet. So they, I didn't expect them to order all three, but they did. And so the week before we're shipping. I mean, they say, fake it till you make that's it. That's exactly, I was faking, I was totally faking it. I'm in the kitchen developing the recipe for the unstake out. And we were pack, and the, my very first try ended up being fairly good. We ended up, we're packaging it out as the truck is going out. I mean, it was absolutely crazy. Something like that would never ever fly. Today, you'd have to do shelf life studies. You know, we do a five day hold on all of our products before we ship anything out uh, for coliforms, yeast and mold. You know, we do ATP swabbing of all the equipment before we run any production. We have a very rigorous uh, quality assurance program. But back then it was like, okay, let's just, let's just get it in there. You know, let's package it, seal it, send it out. No shelf life study, nothing whatsoever. It was a crazy time. <laughs> So then how, then what, what was the next step for you that led you into creating cheese and non-dairy cheese? Sure. Well, you know, I As, had... Especially seeing that it, it had this, you grew up without dairy and without cheese. How did... How well, initially I did, but my father was white, so, and, and he was a huge cheese aficionado. And so my refrigerator, our refrigerator at home was always filled with these exotic European cheeses that oh, okay. most people, m most of my friends had never had. So we had Limburger, we had Camembert, we mm -hmm. had Brie, we had all kinds of, of fancy cheeses, you know, whatever you could get back in the 70s in our refrigerator. So I grew up eating this stuff and I'd fallen, I'd fallen in love with dairy eventually. And dairy was inseparable for me. Like I don't think I went a day without eating, you know, several ounces of cheese and and drinking milk and, and all of that. And back then, you were told that you had to have this stuff. And so, yeah, as I mean, a vegetarian, the, yeah. The, the complete, the right. complete meal That's is right. you have your glass of milk and That's then you right. have what's on your plate. That's exactly and right. And a slice of cheese it also Absolutely. Accompany, accompanies that. <laughs> That's exactly right. So so back in the, you know, I grew, I, this is what I fell in love with. And, and I cooked with so much dairy, it was disgusting. I remember living in Japan entertaining some Japanese people for dinner and I wanted to impress them with a French meal and I every single course was full of butter, eggs, cheese and milk and by the end of the meal even I felt sick. I mean it was just disgusting because it was just so <laughs> heavy. It was so heavy. Yeah. Um, and, and they were told you know by the second course they were just like we're done. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. And uh, what was what was it like when you made your first cheese? 
Your my, first non-dairy. So my cheese. first non-dairy cheese was actually made out of tofu. I'd watch oh, okay. this film. I'd watch this TV show about these nuns in Kyoto that were doing interesting things, things with tofu. They were burying them in ash. They were burying tofu and miso, etc. Wow. So you know, I made something that became a little popular in the United States a few years ago called misozuke, which just means marinated miso. <laughs> but so you can make any kind of misozuke. But if you marinate tofu and miso. It actually transforms the texture, so it becomes buttery and spreadable. Oh, really? And I so, have no idea. Yeah, so I found it to be too salty, so I diluted the miso with white wine and a little bit of meat, which is sweet sake, and I found that was a perfect marinade for miso. After a week, a block of tofu was now this delightful cheese-like product. So that was my very first experiment, and I put, published that in my first cookbook. Um, and then I had a restaurant, the one that I was telling you about. Uh, where we made, and so there we had a seitan parmigiana, and so I developed a cashew cheese that melted that was on top. That was my first one. It wasn't fermented, but it had kind of the stretchy sort of consistency. I think we probably added vinegar or something mm -hmm. to give it that sort of you know sour flavor or tangy flavor. Um, and then I started making cheese out of yogurt. I would make soy yogurt, drain it. Uh, press it and then flavor it with various that things. It was a lot of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work, and that that was why I started the cheese company because I eventually wrote artisan vegan cheese. You are putting out cookbooks and you're sharing cheese making recipes, which sound like a very laborsome task. That you were making your own yogurt and then taking the byproduct from the yogurt to make cheese, and for me that sounds like a lot of work. Well, you, you know, my kitchen looked like a laboratory. People used to come over. My, I had uh, probably, uh, my kids were probably in middle school or high school at the time when I was doing all this experimentation. Their friends would come and there would be like all these experiments, all these cheeses that were fermenting or different stages of production aging on my kitchen counter. And they'd be like, what's going on here? Yes, it is a lot of work and that's what happened. But I, what I really wanted to show people was not how do you make a cheating cheese out of just, you know, whatever, oil and starch. I wanted to show them how you can take plants and, and through natural fermentation, aging, pressing, etc. these so borrowing... these are similar techniques that are used that's in right. traditional cheese That's right. That's exactly right. And traditional cheese making is, you know, it's a labor intensive thing. It's not, it's not instant. Mm -hmm. A lot of Americans want instant. They want to be able to go and make something in 15 minutes. And so what happened when I wrote the book and people like, oh my God, it's going to take me 24 hours to make this cheese, or it's going to be three weeks before this one's done, is that I went around the country on a book tour and people were like, I tried making a couple of your cheeses. They were great. Such a hassle. Can you just make it and sell it and I'll buy it? <laughs> so, and please I just heard that so many times. Please just can you just do it for me? Yes, <laughs> that's exactly right. And so that's how Miyoko cheese has come that's, to be. That's kind of how it came to be. Yeah. So then how, how did you go from being, you know, based in California, creating, you know, now fast forward, you're creating products, you're selling them. What was the big hurdle to then bring it mainstream? Because now I would like to say that you know, the the products you're making of European style mm -hmm. butter and non-dairy cashew-based cheese is mainstream and, and, you know, we can get it. We can yeah. buy your product, whether we're on this product, coast, that right. coast, or in the middle. Or Yeah, or in Canada. You can buy our products at major mass market retailers like Target and Kroger and Publix. Wow. Uh, Trader Joe's, you know, Whole Foods Sprouts. And the major hurdle wasn't sales. It was operational. How do you commercialize, how do you scale these products? The fact is, innovative products such as ours have never been commercialized before. No one had ever done it before. So there's, yeah, there's no footprint. There's no, there's no you can't walk into a commercial space and say like, I wanna do this, and they have the secret sauce ready for That's you That's right, go. you can't, I mean, you don't know what equipment to buy. How do you go from my kitchen to a prototype facility where we're making 40 pound batches, which is what we were doing, which is very, very similar to what we were doing in, in our kitchen, uh, in my personal kitchen, to uh, a factory, you know, which is what we have now, where it's continuous process and you're making on, you know, we have three lines and each line is capable of making 1,500 pounds an hour. How, wow. do you, how do you do that? And that was the biggest challenge, was how do you scale the product? And we really, struggled. It was pretty scary. We built a big facility thinking we knew how to do it. And we built this line thinking that we could make all of our products on this one line. And we made our cheese on it. And it was a disaster. It came out like soup. 
Oh no. It, all the, the cheese would not form. It so just remained liquid. Oh. It, be, it, it remained the way it was before fermentation and we didn't know what to do. It was a major disaster. And so it just took a lot of heads, a lot of really smart people to really think about what do we, what's the thing that's breaking the integrity of the product? Mm -hmm. Why is it turning out like this? And we had to figure it out and we finally did. It took months, it was pretty scary. We almost lost accounts. We lost a lot of shelf space for some of our products. But you know, I'm proud to say that uh, we figured it out in the end and, and now we know how to do it. Now we can actually go to a co-manufacturer and say, you know, we need more capacity. Can you make this product for us? And here's the equipment that you need, and this is how it works. That's really exciting. I, I mean, that's mm -hmm. what I think what's very fun right now is we're in a time with the plant-based movement has mm -hmm. been growing so much momentum, and veganism has been growing yes. so much momentum globally. And now there's all of this really fun pioneering going on in creative food. Oh my God, it's so, it's so <laughs> exciting. It really is. Just walking around here, are going anywhere you know there's so many new products i love trying new products i love supporting new companies i especially love trying other vegan cheese products and there's so many fabulous vegan cheese makers all over the globe now i visited them in in budapest and in vancouver and just places all over the world there's so much stuff going on it's exciting big question if we're talking about different types of cheese can we have like a buffalo mozzarella that's vegan yeah so we have one um it used to be a ball and then we had to scale because we were making these balls of mozzarella um and and that's one thing is that initially we were making them with ice cream scoops mm -hmm. and dropping them into ice into and like into a brine brain. into the brine to form these balls and as we scaled we couldn't do that anymore um and right now they look more like hockey pucks because we changed our processes and this is how companies evolve uh, we're actually getting these larger pockets to make balls again. We're also talking to a traditional mozzarella manufacturer in the country that has the equipment to make our mozzarella the way we used to do it. So we've been talking to them. We have sent our R&D, head of R&D out there to do a test batch. Um, it was pretty good. They got, you know, we, we can make more improvements on it. So this is how products can evolve. You know, I think Beyond Meat at one point launched a Beyond Meat 1.0. It wasn't perfect, and then they launched a 2.0. And, and that's how it is with all these products. As we scale, you can either wait until it's absolutely perfect, or you can get it to the marketplace. Um, start testing start it out. Start testing it out. Maybe it's not 100%, maybe it's 90%. Still, the audience is going to love it. You can keep improving it. You know, you don't have to be perfect. You can be better than so good enough. that's what I was going to say. Do yeah. you ever get bored of cheese or your products? Oh my God, I, 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 we have these cuttings. We have this, some, this thing called Grateful Shreds every week. And, uh, you know, this is where we have that's to taste. Really um, and I have to, it's a funny <laughs> name. I know our R&D team came up mm -hmm. with it. And sometimes I love testing the new stuff. And sometimes it's like, oh my God, I got to taste more cheese. Because <laughs> honestly, I wanted cheese so badly, I created this company. But I'm at a point in my life where really, you know, I really like my rice and vegetables. <laughs> or I like my big salads. I like my vegetables and my legumes. I like to eat very simply. So being, being a mother, I'm curious, did you grow your family up on a vegan diet? I, in, yes, at the, in the home, we were vegan. I didn't restrict uh, them from... You know, I think back when my kids were little, they're in their, their mid to late 20s now, um, there, I didn't, there were no other vegan moms where I lived. And the question was, well, is it better to let them you know, eat birthday cake and pizza mm -hmm. when they go to a party? Or if you don't let them do it, yeah, will they rebel? Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, I just didn't know. I, so we just kept, uh, maintained a vegan household. But when they went out, I let them eat Oh, you know, whatever, as long as they were vegetarian. And I remember when my, when my uh, middle daughter went to high school, she completely rebelled. And I found out that she was eating all this junk food at, at school, eating pizza every day. And she, 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 had her, she got her first email address. It was cheeselover at yahoo.com. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, so <laughs> they totally rebelled. But eventually, they just decided they were vegan. So I've got... Uh, vegan got, daughters. I've got a daughter. My that very daughter, cheese lover at yahoo.com. Mm -hmm. 
um, now has a uh, Instagram page called Weights Not Steak because she's an Olympic style weightlifter. Wow. And she is so proud of being a plant powered weightlifter. Well, that's cool. Yes. I mean, to, to go over that stigma of, you know, you can't have muscles and be strong mm -hmm. and vegan, it's you totally see her not legs. the case oh, at yep. all. There, you know, yep. there's world champions that are that's right. weightlifters that are totally on a plan that's vegan right. diet. That's exactly right. And I know there was a bodybuilder here at the event that was uh, gaining a lot of attention, but in, in terms of the strength uh, component, the only American who has gone to the, the last two Olympics to represent the United States in for Olympic weightlifting was a vegan. That's cool. Um, so, you know, it's definitely possible. My daughter uh, competes at the national level. Uh, she would love to represent the United States um, <laughs> going to the Olympics. I don't know if it happened. It's, the Russians seem to, to out-compete out us there, but, um, you know. So then going back to, to families and, you know, there's a lot of controversy, I think, going on right now as people, you know, become more embraceive of vegan diets, but there's also a lot of pushback on whether it's right to raise your kids vegan. Yep. So I'm really curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think the science is pretty clear that it's very, very easy to raise your kids vegan. I wish I had had the courage to raise them 100% vegan and, and say, you know, you can't have that birthday cake or whatever. I just didn't have the strength and I was just trying to figure out all of that on my own and yeah. figure out what was right and what well, was and wrong. There wasn't as many resources. There now weren't. You know, now you can join a group online or right. there's so many community out there. There is. There's, com there's very supportive community out there for this. I know so many parents that are raising vegan kids today and they are so healthy and vibrant and energetic and the kids are embracing the message of veganism and compassion towards animals and becoming the leaders of tomorrow. I am so proud of of all of these parents. I know so many of them and it's so wonderful to see these vegan these these kid vegan activists out there, you know. It's just wonderful. Vegan activists. That is who you are, yes. I think at your true core. That's right. Was being plant-based or was being vegan, you know, always part of your journey or you know, when did you say forget about this American cheese stuff. Let me let me go vegan. Let me well, that wasn't until my 20s, but I had become a vegetarian at the age of 12, and okay. that was by choice. I don't know what it is about me, because the Japanese believe that you, you, you have to be, you have to fit into the culture, you have to fit into society. You don't make waves, and that's the way you're taught in Japan. But for some reason, I've always had a rebellious nature. I, and I don't know why, but I do remember when I was 12, I went vegetarian. I went on a camping trip with some vegetarians. Somehow I made that connection. I came home and I announced that I was no longer eating meat. And it was like not a big deal for me. I just lost all taste for meat because I made that connection between the pork chop on my plate with that my mother served me and the animal that it came from. And I just couldn't see it as being food anymore and so it was not difficult and I was very rebellious and a few a few months later my mother just said you know what I'm not preparing a vegetarian meal for you and you know everything else for everybody else you you're on your own you cook you learn to cook and that's how I learned how to I started cooking when I was probably 12 and a half um, and eventually I, I just learned to love cooking and then eventually when I went vegan I just dove into it because it was how do I capture all these rich and wonderful flavors that I've grown accustomed to and make them vegan. How do I veganize everything that I love? That became my mission in life. So can you explain to me, like, you know, really, what is the difference of being a product that promotes being plant-based versus being a product that promotes being vegan? Because there is a difference and there yes. is some core values there. Yeah, I think plant-based is, you know, I think vegan products are all plant-based. Um, a lot of people feel, well, plant-based is about, you know, I want to be healthy. And I think that's great. I that's think always, I think, it's but, you always, know, getting the door open. That's right. It gets the door open, but at some point, it's not just about personal health. If we just think about our personal health, we don't think beyond ourselves. It doesn't matter if we've got washboard abs. It doesn't matter if you can be an ultra marathoner on a plant-based diet, if the planet is dying, if all the other animals on the planet, if the species are being wiped out because of animal agriculture. We have to think beyond ourselves. We have to think about the lives of all living beings on this planet. We have to think about 
the living planet itself. We have to think about whether or not we can feed 10 billion people. We have to think about the amount of land that's allocated to animal agriculture and what that's doing in terms of food equity for people across the globe. Um, you know, just because we're in an, in a, an area where we can afford to eat um, expensive plant-based foods or, or let's say, um, Oh, I only eat humanely slaughtered beef that's been raised on 12 acres of land. Well, you know, what about the person who can't afford that? What about the person in India or Africa or somewhere else in a food desert right here in the United States that doesn't have access to healthy, sustainable, organic foods? We have to start thinking about them. So, yes, personal health is important. And if you just go vegan and try to avoid vegan junk food, except on occasion, you're going to be healthy. But let's go beyond that. Let's start thinking beyond ourselves. It is critical right now at this juncture in human history. We have 11 years left to change the course of human history and the course of this planet to ensure that we have a planet to live on. So if we have 11 years, what is it then that people, individuals can be empowered to creating change? Because I think it's really easy to to see the the news out there of you know information coming out about 2050 might be like where the end of civilization is or the oceans are going to be dead by 2040 yes. and it's really overwhelming and you know it's very difficult as an individual just to get through your your day it's you know right so then we put on you know you must think about the animals and environment but it's over, it can be overwhelming. it's overwhelming and so how can we as an individual feel empowered in our own selves and that's where I think a vegan diet is what you know really is the answer. I, I completely agree with you I mean you know thinking about all the suffering in the world can overwhelm a person's psyche and you can you know just feel like you can't do anything about it and I think that's what happens with most people most people feel overwhelmed so they're relying on government uh, to change regulations or industry to solve the problems. You know, uh, one of the presidential candidates said, you know, it's up to the industry to, to solve this problem. Well, it's not really. Industry isn't going to be able to solve it. Well, and we have, dollars is really what pushes industry that's exactly to make changes. Right. So as a consumer, you have the choice to, that's to exact, vote with That's that. exactly right. Voting with your dollars is so important. And we have to remember that the world is made up of individuals. So the faster that individuals can make that change, if you can make a commitment to a vegan diet, uh, you're going to be saving the planet. And then knowing that, just having that knowledge is a key to your own personal happiness. Because you can wake up every day feeling empowered that I am doing something to help change the course of the planet. With that, you're not only involved in your own company of Miyoko, but you're also part of the plant-based, I'm gonna get it wrong. Plant-based Plant Foods Association. Yeah, food, yes. I, that's, so you're yeah. also a founding member of yes. the Plant-Based Food Association. So what is the mission behind the association and, and what does that really mean? It's a, the first trade organization to represent this industry. And some of the challenges that we're having uh, have to do with regulation. And so the, the, in, the, the trade so association- So when you say that the plant-based market's having issue with regulation, I would think foods that aren't involving you know, meat and dairy would be safer and easier to get out or? Sure, but there's an incumbent industry. So the trade organization uh, exists in order to level the playing field. So let's just talk about meat and dairy for a minute. Uh, meat and dairy, certain crops such as uh, corn and soy that go to feed livestock, about 80% of the soy and corn that we grow in this country go to feed livestock, they're heavily subsidized by by taxpayer dollars. Yep. We have an uneven system, unfair system of favoring things like meat and dairy that are part of the uh, school lunch program, the USDA's dietary guidelines, uh, the checkoff program, which is a government mandated advertising program uh, that's funded by the industry, but it's mandated by the government. There's so many programs that benefit animal products. So that is not a level playing field. There's no, there's no uh, you know, subsidies going to, let's say, growing of organic vegetables. It just doesn't exist. But it does go to, to the crops that feed animals or to the dairy industry, et cetera. Which all of these subsidies help keep those prices artificially low. Well, yep. There's also regulations about what we can call these new products. So that, that actually makes a lot of sense then why, you know, sometimes people 
will say, but veganism or plant-based diet, it's expensive. You know, right. I can't afford it. And it goes to prove, yeah, or to your point of, you know, the government is what is subsidizing the prices for, you, you know, a meal to be less expensive at a fast food joint or, you know, going and picking up a chicken breast over, That's you know, right. kale. But the interesting thing is that the industry is threatened by the plant-based industry. So right now, in 25 states in America, there's either legislation or legislation that's trying to be passed that limits the use of words like sausage or meat or chicken or whatever on these innovative products. The same thing is happening in the dairy, industry, the dairy category because we have something that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has called the Standards of Identity. Which, yes, yes. which only covers a, a very limited mm -hmm. Um, categories, which is dairy. So, for example, cheese or milk is defined as the lacteal secretions of one or more healthy cows, free of colostrum, and so on and so on and so on. And so, it, you, you, you can't technically, you can't legally call, you know, we can't call our product cheese. So then how do you get around that right now? We break the law. That's what we do. You we, are we, a rebel. Yes, we are a rebel. Rebel girl. We are a rebel girl. All, yeah, we're rebel company all the way. And that's what we're doing. And why are we doing that? Well, in the very beginning, we didn't call our products cheese. We called it cultured nut product. And that was kind of like the big joke. And we got a lot of media about it because it was like, well, we can't say it's cheese, so we're calling it cultured nut product. I mean, but, uh, this is going to sound nasty, yeah. but it just sounds like yeast infection of nuts. That's exactly that's know. exactly right. It does kind of sound <laughs> like that. It sounds nasty. Tasty. Yeah, I mean, no one goes into the store and says, hey, where can I find the cultured nut product? And so mm -hmm. it's going to limit your market. Uh, and we, we just finally said enough is enough. And so we changed our packaging. We decided we're going to call it cheese because that's what everybody calls it. And we started calling it that. Our sales spiked because now there are, are probably... Are you afraid of then uh, no. having backlash or...? Of course not. No, we've met with the FDA. Uh, you know, we're leading the revolution. We are having a conversation with the FDA. We're having a conversation with the California division, the CDFA. We're having a conversation with everybody. We're fighting legislation in different places because uh, there's First Amendment rights to be able to call these products such as cheese or butter or milk as long as we're providing clarity for the consumer by not misleading them. We're not calling our products simply butter. We're writing vegan butter made from cashews. No consumer goes in there and says, well, that butter, oh my God, I thought it was from cows. It just well, doesn't happen. Well, that is the argument that you know, is being put forth from some of the larger industries. Like from I the know dairy that, industry. Yeah, and yes. even, even down in Louisiana, the, mm -hmm. the USA Rice is having a big fight back on cauliflower right now. Yes, cauliflower because, rice, you know, yes. cauliflower can't be rice, it must be rice is rice. Yeah, right, but right. But rice doesn't, is not one of these identified. It's not uh, a, yeah, it's yeah, not a so standard of identity. So it's really interesting right now to see how state by state legislatures may change what can be called what, where only certain things are covered on the federal level. That's right. That, it's, that's exactly right. But it's interesting because language evolves, and and you know whatever we call something today may not be what it is in the future. I think what it what's important is is the consumer confused or not. I don't think consumers are confused by cauliflower rice. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're confused by milk of magnesia. I don't think they're confused by coconut milk or cocoa butter or Miyoko's vegan butter made from cashews. You know, So that's really where we need to drive it. But the incumbent industry is threatened and they're afraid and they're the ones that are attacking us. You know, cons people can get more involved in the legislation uh, proceedings and things like that is, you know, how can how can sure. we help? Yeah, sure. The, uh, the, so the, the FDA w did have a request for information where they were accepting public comments. Um, that's ended. Um, so, but I think you can still, you know, you can still send a note to the FDA or in your uh, law, write letters to your senator, to your Congress people, to let them know that you stand by the nomenclature that the plant-based industry has adopted. I think that's probably the most important thing is write to your local politicians and let them know you, you support this rising economy of plant-based foods. Awesome. So power to the people. That's right. Power to the people. <laughs> Absolutely. I just want to talk forever, but yeah. <laughs> um, I know you're very busy and you've been speaking and doing demos 
and you know, I just really want to thank you so much, Miyoko, for taking a little time to speak with us. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes next for you on on your adventure and for your company to grow. So, well, thank you so much for having me on this. <laughs> really enjoyed it.